This is part two of our flipped classroom for September 30th. Uh, we are going over 10.3.2, Teddy Roosevelt and Big Stick Diplomacy. Remember that you should be using the notes that I printed out and gave to you last class, and you are annotating and making meaning out of them, adding examples, drawing out the connections, adding the greater themes, and any additional in essential information I'm giving you. So we're looking at 10.3.2, and by the end, you will be able to answer the prompt, compare and contrast Teddy Roosevelt's foreign policy to his predecessors, Last video, I explained Teddy Roosevelt to you how he was already a big change for the presidency. And in this video, I'll go over how he's a big change for our foreign policy through big stick diplomacy, his Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, and then last but not least, the Panama Canal. Remembering that our bullet asks for the impacts of the foreign policy, so we have to focus on how did um, Teddy's decisions in his foreign policy affect the United States and how did it affect the other countries in Latin America. We're also focusing on change, key concept. So now heading into Teddy's presidency, a big part of where his concern was, was in our sphere of influence in the Western Hemisphere, especially since we just started setting up our insular empire up in the Caribbean, um, getting both, well, getting Puerto Rico and then having um, Cuba as a protectorate. And so we are still concerned with Latin America, just like we were starting with in the 1820s, specifically 1823 and the Monroe Doctrine. Um, and Teddy has some big concern about Latin America. A big part of it is these countries are fairly young. They are pretty weak governments. They're kind of corrupt governments. They're also in debt to a lot of European nations um, and being exploited by those European trading partners. And so this deeply conflicts with the Monroe Doctrine um, and wanting to keep Europe out of our sphere of influence because ultimately um, the European governments have the upper hand and are easily able to manipulate the countries in Latin America and the US does not want that. So the first time that this really comes to be an issue for Teddy is with Venezuela, which is right here. Um, so in December of 1902, they fault on their debts to Germany, Britain, and then Italy. And so what happens is um, the European countries say, hey, you gotta pay us back and Venezuela is unable to. And so what they do is they set up a blockade with the potential of being able to attack Venezuela. Now the US does not want this. So Teddy is like, hmm, previous presidents probably would have just waited until an issue came. But what I'm gonna do is think ahead of time and try to be proactive with this problem. Instead of intervening or going to war, what he decides to do is pressure arbitration between the European countries and Venezuela. Remembering that arbitration is about mediation, he's going to play that role of benevolent neutral that the United States set out and said that we would do at the Pan American Conference. And so this is the route that he chooses to take. And in this arbitration, um, the blockade ends, the, the issue ends and it never becomes um, this escalated problem. Now, historiographically speaking, a big question is how much did Big Stick actually play in the decisions of the Europeans to stop the blockade? Well, um, Edmund Norris would say that Teddy Roosevelt essentially threatened war to the diplomats, and he sent that to the German diplomat. German diplomat took it back to, or sent it over to Germany, and that was immediately when, okay, let's end the blockade. Proving that Big Stick and that action and standing up and arbitrating really was effective for Teddy. However, another historian, Nancy Mitchell, says mm, that's not quite the case because Teddy never even told anyone that he threatened war until 14 years after um, this took place. And we still can't find any evidence of this happening. Um, and she says, Instead, really what it was, was Britain kind of like backed down on this whole issue. And because Britain withdrew support, Germany was like, oh, OK, well, then I guess we can't really follow through on this blockade. And it was ultimately Britain who played the role. Um, and so there are de historiographical debates about this. But this is definitely one of the first instances in which Teddy is going to use that big stick and step in. Um, and because we are going to have so much going on in Latin America, I'm having you guys track on, in your interactive notebooks, the different countries and what's going on in each of them so we can have a reference point. I'm also going to help give us some make it sticks, one of which is Venezuela arbitration. 
Uh, Venezuela ends with an A, ultimately leading to arbitration, and so that A is connecting. Um, and you'll see in the next example that there's another connector. So Venezuela arbitration. Um, and this is going to be important to know because then we go to the Dominican Republic in 1903, who falls on bonds to the United States. And so Teddy decides to take a different route in this case. What he does is he steps in to this country out in the Caribbean, well not literally step out, um, but he sends a financial advisor to take over their customs. Customs are um, controlling the duties and um, that happen on imports. So what he does is he sends an, uh, an American financial advisor and says, hey, this is how you are going to run your customs. You are going to allocate 55% of what you get on customs to paying us back and to paying back other European countries. And so this is the route that he chooses to take. Um, and instead of invading, he's just going to take action. He's trying to be preemptive with his decision making. Um, so that way a crisis does not happen. And notice the Dominican Republic, very closely related, um, located between both Cuba and Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, we have um, made an unincorporated territory. And then Cuba is our protectorate under the Platt Amendment at this point. The way to remember what happens in the Dominican Republic is Dominican Republic ends with the C. Customs, the choice that Teddy made, also um, has that C in common. So Venezuela arbitration, Dominican Republic customs. So ultimately what we get out of this is Teddy's foreign policy, which is called big stick. Taking action before a crisis, before something could potentially happen, a war that could threaten national security, that could threaten US trade, we're gonna take care of it ahead of time. Whether it be arbitration or taking over customs or some other sort of financial advisement. What's important to Teddy is that in order to have a successful foreign policy, we gotta be able to back it up. This was what the Monroe Doctrine was lacking, and this is what Teddy is able to do. Because remember, in the previous video, we talked about how he is professionalizing the military, and by 1910, we are getting the third strongest Navy in the world. And then this, because he's being so active, is also where extraterritoriality comes into play, extraterritoriality. Um, he's enforcing laws American laws for Americans outside of our territory. Um, it becomes a tool of imperialism and is controversial, obviously, for the countries in which he is applying this to. So now where does he get this term big stick? Um, it comes from a proverb that says, speak softly and carry a big stick, you will go far. What this means is to take action. Um, and so Teddy, a lot of the times, will take action and he will carry that big stick and use it with the threat of the military. However, it is important to note that there are times where he does speak softly, which we will look at next class, um, where in 1905, he arbitrates for the Russo-Japanese War. In 1906, he mediates another settlement over Morocco at the El Siras Conference. And so he is speaking softly in some situations, but he does carry that big stick. Another really big thing um, is he develops a very close, strong relationship with Great Britain, a very unwritten, unspoken alliance, but that we are supporting each other in many situations. Um, for example, the open door policy um, and then backing up the Monroe Doctrine for us at certain points and having their support, even though it's unspoken. So that would be the examples of speak softly. Um, but now what we're going to do is um, look at more examples of that big stick. So part of it is what he does is he takes that big stick diplomacy, adds it to the Monroe Doctrine, which really had no military threat, no way to back it up, and revamps the Monroe Doctrine. And this is where a lot of historians like we looked at in 10.1 said that the Monroe Doctrine wasn't really applied until Teddy Roosevelt dusted it off. What the Roosevelt Corollary says is, of course, yes, we want to remove any potential threat of the Europeans um, intervening in the Americas. But Teddy's saying, I don't just want to remove that threat um, by asserting that to the Europeans, but I'm also going to make sure that the Latin American countries are behaving responsibly. Are they paying their debts? Are they doing what they are supposed to do and being financially responsible? So that's where he's going to step in and be proactive with that big stick, send in those financial advisors, and be proactive in preventing a crisis from occurring. Kind of like Ron Swanson with a permit. 
So Roosevelt Corollary ultimately makes the United States an international police force that we're going to go in there and regulate beforehand. We are going to use our military to protect our business interests. Um, and he assures in a message to Congress in 1905 that we are respecting the republics of Latin America and their independence. We're not going to mess with our governments, but we're also not going to just be a shield and a crutch for them to protect them from um, repaying their debts and acting responsibly. Um, and we do not want a war because of debt collection. Remember, the American public is all about security. Um, that's why they want to be isolationists and not internationalists like Teddy um, has wanted. And so he is going to implement the Roosevelt Corollary to prevent war because of debt collection. So now let's head into the Panama Canal. We've been keeping our eye on the Panama Canal for quite a while, waiting to set it up because it is going to make trade much easier by being able to cut through this isthmus, save us lots of time. Um, in fact, a boat or a ship during the Spanish-American War, the USS Oregon, almost missed the war because of how many extra months it takes to travel down around South America. So we need to find a way to get a hold of the Panama Canal. That is Teddy's goal. Well, the French had had it for a while. Um, they had tried building the canal after eight years of not just lack of success of building the canal, but a huge struggle with all of the um, geographical obstacles that are in the way and the malaria and the yellow fever. Um, we end up getting the French to sell the rights to the canal to us. So this is sold to us in the Spooner Act of 1902, and then we are able to get it, uh, the rights to the canal. And Teddy is definitely using big stick here because at first they wanted $109 million and he said, mm, okay, well, if you're not going to give it to us, then we don't want to go through here. We'll just go through a different country. We'll go through Nicaragua. And ultimately the French sell the rights to us for $40 million. Um, and so now we have the rights to the canal and a big part going way back um, is we were only able to get the rights because Great Britain is going to waive the 1850 Clayton Bulwer Treaty, the treaty that said, hey, if we're going to do a canal, we're going to have like a collective unit effort between the United States and England on this. Well, in 1901, they were really distracted by the Boer War. They were seeking friendship with us. So they set up the Hay Ponce Fort Treaty, which is going to give us the rights to it. Now, the only step is to get the rights to the land um, in order to build the canal. And well, Panama is under the control of Colombia. And Colombia wants $15 million. And Teddy Roosevelt's like, what irresponsible bandits for like thinking that they can charge us this much. So he tries to threaten them with the whole Nicaragua thing. They don't fall for it. And he's like, and then take the offer off the table. Um, and so Teddy's like, oh crap. Now we really have to go through Nicaragua. Well, in Nicaragua, there is a huge volcano that erupts. Um, and that really just shows we can't do that. So we do need to go through Panama in order to get this isthmus. And guess what Teddy hears of on November 3rd, 1903? Panama is about to revolt. Now he's like, yeah, self-determination, let's go in and support. So what he does, um, sends a battleship, the Nashville down there and some Marines. He's going to use the ship to pre prevent the Colombian troops from being able to land and stop the rebellion. And by November 18th, we have the Hey Bunau Varia Treaty, um, which says that we are able to, sorry, I forgot to click through this. Um, the Hey Bunau Varia Treaty, Panama immediately sets up with us 1904 and we get to build the canal. It is officially built by 1914. So he uses that big stick to support the Panamanian Revolution, to convince um, countries to sell it to uh, the France to sell it to us for less, and we get the Panama Canal. Um, and this is a pretty controversial situation for Teddy Roosevelt. He looks at it as the biggest success of his presidency, but many other people say that it is the worst thing because he totally overstepped on Colombia as a country. He treaded on their rights by supporting the revolution in order to progress the United States rights over the canal. Um, and Elihu Root, the Secretary of War at the time, when it's discussed about Teddy Roosevelt's overstepping his actions, you've shown that you were accused of seduction and you've conclusively proved that you were guilty of rape. So this is a huge part of Teddy Roosevelt and looking at him. Um, Panama Canal, Big Stick, Roosevelt, Corollary. Now get ready to watch the next video about how to effectively prepare a prompt.